Welcome to Helmer Church. Glad to have you join with us for this time in the Word of God. I should tell you that this is a little bit different for us right now. Normally we would have a service with people here, worshipers, but right now we have a snowstorm approaching. The conditions are deteriorating and it is just me in this large gymnasium with our great camera person, Kristen, and I want to thank her for coming in early so we'd be able to uh, do this before the weather gets uh, too bad. So we're going to look at the Word of God in spite of the weather and trust that this message as it goes out will be of encouragement to you. As we begin, I want to share with you something that happened some time ago in Pennsylvania. There was a man who was arrested for burglary and theft. It seems that he had a neighbor who was cooking meatballs out in the garage. He had left the pot of meatballs. When he came back, it was gone. He couldn't find his uh, delicious meal that he was preparing. Well, he and the police found the culprit. It was a neighbor down the street who was the one who had stolen the meatballs. And the reason he was discovered was because he was simply standing out in his front yard and there was red sauce all over his face. And that was the giveaway. That was the clue. The scripture says, be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers 32 and verse 23. Be sure your sin will find you out. That's what happens. The red sauce is there, giving you away. Your sin has found you out. We're going to be looking at King David in this message. And this time we're going to look at King David and a great man's failure. There was a time in David's life as king when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He also had her husband murdered in an effort to cover up the crime. David was a man after God's own heart, we learn from Scripture, and yet he was a man who was sinful just like all of we all of us are in fact his sins are there out in the open for us to read about we wouldn't like it if our sins were out there for all to read but his are because the holy spirit wants us to learn from david's experience and as we come to the text in second samuel chapter 12 we're going to find that God handles sinners. He deals with sinners in a particular way. And we're going to see that as we make our way uh, through some of the verses in 2 Samuel chapter 12. To begin with, we want to see God's pursuit. God's pursuit of the sinner. Look with me at 2 Samuel chapter 12 and just the first part of verse 1. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. God takes the initiative. God pursues this man. David had fallen into sin. There was no way around it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has said that Satan doesn't fill us with hatred of God, but with forgetfulness of God. I think that's the case with David. He didn't hate God, but he forgot God. He got caught up in himself, in his lust, and he sinned. And then the cover-up 
was terrible in having Uriah Bathsheba's soldier husband placed right in the front of the battle where he would be sure to be killed. But God pursued David, this man who had forgotten the Lord. That's the way God is in dealing with us. He takes the initiative. He goes the extra mile to find the sinner, to call the sinner back to himself. Francis Thompson was a man who lived during the years 1859 to 1907. As a young man, he thought he would become a priest. So he went to seminary, but didn't finish the course. He next tried to become a doctor, but he couldn't handle medicine, and he failed. Next, he wanted to be a soldier. In the military, he lasted only a day. Finally, he ended up on the streets of London, an opium addict, in bad shape, in need of God. He had fled such a distance from the Lord, but the Lord followed him. And that's what God does. God follows after the fleeing sinner, and he does so with grace. Francis Thompson was saved there in London, saved out of that addiction. Saved out of that wayward life, he was born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. And after trying all of these different vocations, if you will, Francis Thompson became a poet. He wrote poetry, and perhaps his most famous poem is one titled, The Hound of Heaven. Francis Thompson penned words which told of God being like a hound chasing after the prey. Thompson knew he was the prey, and the hound that chased him until he caught him was God himself, the hound of heaven. Aren't you glad that we are privileged to know and follow a God who has first followed us? who sought us and bought us with Jesus' redeeming blood, who didn't give up on us, who didn't give up on you. And perhaps this day you may say you're far from God. Remember, He is the hound of heaven. He is seeking you. For Jesus said Himself, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. God's pursuit of David. He sent Nathan the prophet to speak to him. But also, will you note with me, God's parable. Nathan the prophet tells David a story, a parable in the last part of verse 1 through verse 6. Look with me, if you will. And he came to him, that is, Nathan came to David and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. 
He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. David, upon hearing this story, this parable of God, said the man who would steal the one lamb, the precious lamb belonging to the poor man, deserves to die. Deserves to die. The rich man had taken the one lamb belonging to the poor man, even though the rich man had flocks and herds. And Nathan was zeroing in on David's sin. David realizes the terrible act of this rich man in stealing a little ewe lamb. David realized the man in the story was a thief in his foolishness. A thief in his foolishness. And David was struck by what this rich man had done, according to Nathan's story. Well, you notice something else with me here. Not only do we find... Uh, God's pursuit and God's parable, the story that impacts David. But now we find God's point. God's point. And look with me at it in verse 7 and the first part of verse 13. Nathan then said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, is it I who anointed you king over Israel? And it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. And then the first part of verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. God's point in Nathan, the prophet, going to David and sharing that story was to show David his sin. It was a powerful message that the prophet brought to David. David had been trying to cover up his sin with Bathsheba and with Uriah for about a year when this takes place now. He had lived a lie. He had been the thief. And now he has found out. And Nathan says, David, you are the man. You, you are very much taken with anger that a rich man would steal a little lamb from a poor man, but you have done the very same thing. You've taken the wife of a soldier. When you have wives, you have concubines, you have a harem. And of course, this was all against God's directive that kings were not to multiply wives but David had gone his own way in that as well. And David, in his lust, took another's wife. You are the man. David saw himself. This points to the fact, beloved, that God's Word is a mirror. It is a mirror that shows us ourselves. And let's face it, when we look at the mirror, God's holy word, we get the truth about ourselves. For example, we're told for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. For there is not one righteous, no, not one. God's word is that mirror that shows us who we really are. Especially when it comes to our spiritual state before the Lord. So David got the point. You are the man. Has it ever happened in your life where you knew God was speaking to you from the pages of His Word 
And he was saying in one way or another, you are the man. You are the woman. You have sinned. You have broken God's law. You're heading down a wrong path. You're on a broad road, a broad way that leads to destruction, that leads to eternal hell. You're going the wrong way. You are the man. You are the woman. You see, that, that word of God is a hard word, but it's also a gracious word. Because we have to see, you have to see, and I have to see my own sin, your own sin, so that we can flee to the refuge of the Lord's grace and mercy. We can come to the mercy seat of God's forgiveness and grace as found in the very cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus says, come to me. I'll give you rest from your futile labor trying to save yourself. Come, come to the cross. Come to the grace. It was grace that followed David. God's initiative. And then David saw himself and his need. God's pursuit, God's parable, God's point. Also, God's provision. And we have to go to this. God's provision. Look with me at the last part of verse 13. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. The Lord has taken away your sin. You shall not die. This is a, this is a word of comfort. This is a word of love. This is a word of mercy for the sinner. And notice it there. The Lord also has taken away your sin. It's interesting that a literal translation of this might read, your sin has passed away. Your sin has passed away. Your sin doesn't figure in anymore. It's not operative. Your sin is dead. Well, how could it be dead? Well, the Lord has taken away your sin. The Lord has taken away your sin. And this is, this is the provision that God had, had made for David as David believed God and trusted his mercy and his forgiveness. And we find David writing in Psalm 32. Look with me, if you will, at that. Psalm 32. Let's look at the first five verses. Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. David writes, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. You forgave the guilt of my sin. That word translated guilt means crookedness. You forgave the crookedness of my sin. You forgave the crookedness of my life. David acknowledges in a confession of sin that he was indeed the man 
But note the encouragement that comes. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. David had tried to cover his sin. And you can do the very same thing. And I perhaps I'm talking to someone right now. You're seeking to cover your own sin. It may be adultery. It may be immorality. It may be murder. It may be envy. It may be bitterness. An unforgiving attitude. Sin is sin. We all are sinners through and through. But when you try to cover your sin, you're going to be miserable, or, or it, may, it may be pleasurable for a time. We read of Moses in Hebrews 11.25, where Moses rejected the passing pleasures of sin. He rejected that, but it does say pleasures of sin. Pleasures of sin are very real. It was real for David when he first encountered Bathsheba. There was pleasure in that. But the pleasure is passing. The passing, the transient pleasures of sin. Don't cover your sin. The best you can do is to confess it to God. Open to God and realize the Lord God has been pursuing you wanting you to be set free from the cover-up, to be set free from the bondage to sin, to be set free to know the Lord and to worship Him and to not be burdened with a heavy weight of guilt and shame. There is forgiveness in the Lord. There is life in the Lord. There is victory over sin in the Lord God. Someone has written, the world says you have made your bed, now you must lie in it. But one who is greater than the world has said, take up your bed and walk. Your sins are forgiven. There it is. Your sins are forgiven in Christ Jesus. His sacrifice. His death for your sins at the cross. How does God deal with sinners? Well, we've looked at God's pursuit God's pursuit of the sinner. We've looked at God's parable. God's story. Given to convict of sin. We've looked at God's point. David, you are the man. You're the sinner. And then we noted God's provision of forgiveness in Jesus Christ. This hound of heaven, the Lord God, faithfully pursues sinners. To bless them with grace and mercy. If they will but see their sin and call upon the name of the Lord. There was an apartment complex out near Portland, Oregon. And the manager of that complex had a very difficult time with a family that was living in one of the apartments. It seemed that that family was very dirty, very filthy. Their apartment was a mess. And this manager had to warn them, you, you can't be living like this in this complex. But they paid her no heed. She gave them time. She gave them almost a year to straighten up 
but they didn't do it, and finally they were evicted. And after they were evicted from the apartment, it was discovered that that apartment was filled with trash, soiled and dirty. There was a stench in the air. They had not taken out their trash for almost a year. It had just been collecting and building inside that apartment. So the office manager, the apartment manager, had to bring in a 40-foot dumpster and begin the process of cleaning out all the trash. Beloved, God desires to clean out the trash in your life. And He does that with His Word and with His gentle call to you the sinner, as he calls to me, the sinner, to confess my sins to God. And as we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is through confession of sin and repentance, turning from those sins, that the trash is addressed. And furthermore, look with me to the cross. And as we look to the cross, we'll see that your trash and my trash were nailed there on Jesus. He took the trash, the sin, the ugliness, the stench of it, and died for it on the cross so that you might be free forever. David came to an experience of mercy and grace, and the Holy Spirit wanted us to know about it in the pages of God's Word, that you and I might be challenged to deal with our sin in our lives, to give it to God in true repentance, and then to live in the realization that praise God, praise Jesus Christ, that at the cross He took the trash, the trash that belongs to you and to me, and has set us free. Praise God. Worship Him and love Him today. Amen.